HTML and CSS form the backbone of the web. Every website uses HTML and CSS, and if you want to be able to share data online in an engaging way, and you want users to find it easy to interact with your page and send your data back, then you need to use HTML and CSS as well. In this video, I'll show you how to code HTML forms that your users can submit using their browsers to send you data over the internet. So it'll be a nice, useful introduction to HTML and CSS. Welcome back to my Flash Tutorial for Beginner series. If you don't know much about websites and how the internet works, and you haven't seen the first video in this series, I'd recommend checking it out. I've left it linked in the description. HTML and CSS work together to paint complete websites. HTML provides the structure and meaning of the content, and CSS provides the styling and layout. As an example, here's a simple web form for adding transactions to an imaginary personal finance tracking app. Using only HTML, we have the content all there, but it's not so nice to look at. The elements are all very close together, the fonts are all the defaults of the browser, and so on. But now here's the exact same HTML code, but with an extra CSS layer added to it. The content is exactly the same, but now we've changed fonts, colors, spacing between and around elements, and even added borders to separate the different field sets. HTML and CSS are super powerful. You can do pretty much anything you like on a website just with them, including things like animations, content changes, hover effects. You can even draw illustrations just with HTML and CSS. Let's learn a bit about HTML and CSS while coding this very form. Code with me during this video. That's the best way to learn. And if you want to check out the final code, I'm going to leave it linked in the description below. Your browser can open HTML files on its own without using Flask, and will work purely with HTML in this video. In a later video, we'll hook it up with Flask so that we can receive the form data and store it in a database. HTML on its own can't access a database. I'll start by creating an HTML file. You can call it whatever you want, as long as it ends in .html, and then I'm going to open the file with my browser. Normally, you can just double-click the file to do that. It should be associated with your browser by default. HTML documents are composed of HTML elements. Elements are written using tags, usually an opening tag and a closing tag, although some elements don't have closing tags. The first element we'll add is a doc type element that tells the browser to read this file as an HTML document. We'll then add the HTML element, which contains all the HTML content. Inside it, we'll add the head and body elements as well. In the head, we place other elements which describe the broad features of the page, such as the title of the page, the author, and other required resources by the page, for example, CSS style sheets, which we'll add in just a moment. Inside the body, we'll place everything else, everything that the user will see. By the way, if you're enjoying this video and you'd like to support the channel, please hit like and subscribe. Let's see if we can reach 25,000 subscribers by the end of 2020. HTML elements also can have attributes which add more meaning to the elements themselves. For example, we'll add lang equal en to the HTML element to describe the human language in which the page content is written. En stands for English. Let's add some more code. Inside the body tag, I'll add a heading using the h1 element, and then a form element as well. My form will contain fields, such as for the date a transaction was made, as well as labels to tell users what each field is for. Every pair of label and field will be inside a div element. Div is used to group together other elements, but it doesn't add any meaning to the page on its own. The grouping is necessary so that later on, with CSS, we can make style changes to the div separately from the elements inside it. It'll make more sense when we get to that section in the CSS part of this video. My three fields are the date of a transaction, the amount the transaction was for, and also what account the transaction should be added to. The account will be a dropdown, so I'll use a select element here, which contains option elements for, well, for each option in the dropdown. Finally, at the bottom, I'll add another input element, which is used to submit the form. This will show up as a button on the final page. Something important to note is that most of my input elements have different type attributes. This is useful for the browser to know what sort of data should be written in each field. The browser can also display them differently and perform some validation for you, and your users will understand a bit more easily what sort of thing they should type in them. 
Every field in a form, including the select, should also have a name attribute. This is what we'll use later on in Flask to access the data inside each field. The ID attribute here is used to link the labels with the fields. The class attribute will be used later on to modify specific elements using CSS. You can think of this as a targeting mechanism. Some elements have multiple classes, separated by a space. When we use CSS, the styles that we write under both classes will be applied to those elements that have more than one class. Now that we've got this done, you can see what it looks like on the browser. I'm going to leave this browser open while we work on the CSS styles for the page. So let's go ahead and create the CSS file. I'll call mine style.css. We also have to go back to the HTML document and link to the CSS file from the head. Then the browser will know to download the CSS file and use it when painting the HTML document. In the CSS file, we write selectors and rules. The rules will apply to every element that matches the selector. For example, we can select the HTML element and modify the font family property. That'll basically change which font we're using in the entire document. One of the central pieces of CSS though is the box model. According to it, elements have a content, which may be a particular size, and around that content we have a padding. Around that we have a border, and around that we have a margin. Let's say we have an element with a background color. We can add padding to that element, and spacing will be added inside the element, so that the colored section grows. We can then add a border, and that works just as you'd expect. The border is added outside the padding. We can change the thickness, the color, and the style of the border as well. If we add margin, that separates the element from other elements, or from the sides of the window, but the space is added outside the element, so you'd see no background color in the margin area. I'll make a few changes to the CSS file to add some spacing around elements and change font sizes. I'll also center the whole body element by giving it a maximum width of 1000 pixels and a margin of auto, which calculates the required margin at the left and right so that they are the same, effectively centering the element. For every field set, I'll add a very thin and light border at the bottom to separate them, but I'll make sure not to add such border underneath the submit button field set by using the not last of type CSS selector. The submit button itself needs a few more modifications as well, including a border radius to round the corners a bit. Setting float to right will move the button to the right side of its container, and cursor to pointer will show a hand instead of the arrow cursor when we hover over it. Talking about hovering, I'll use the hover CSS selector to set specific styles when the user is hovering over the button. I'll invert the button when that happens by setting a dark background color and a light text color. Now when we hover over the button, it's clear that we're hovering over something that we can interact with. This video is getting a bit long, so I've gone quite quickly, but if you want to learn more about HTML and CSS, as well as the whole web development process, then please check out our complete Python web course, which I've left linked in the description. It's on a great sale for the next five days just for you guys. In the next video in this series, we'll move away from HTML and CSS and I'll show you how to link those two with Flask so that we can receive form data in our Python code. Check out the complete playlist for this series in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching this video. Consider liking and subscribing if you like the video and I'll see you in the next one.